Thanks, Benji. Hey, it's good to see everybody. If I haven't uh, gotten to meet you yet or we haven't gotten to say hi, my name is Dan Kohler and uh, I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, This summer we're walking through the book of Galatians and it's been a real joy. And today I'm really excited because we kind of hit a crescendo. Uh, But first, I want to tell you some of my baggage. That's what I get to do. Like, you don't have the microphone, I do. So I get to do that. Um, No, it's it's good baggage. I was, we had some people over at our house last night, some friends, and we were just kind of talking about uh, how we view our parents differently now. As the older we get, the more you view your parents differently. When I was younger, uh, my parents would tell me to do something, and it was just like you, you hop to it. And, and I was like, my dad wasn't severe. My dad was actually very gracious, but I was always like just in fear of breaking the rules. I was in fear of getting in trouble. I was the kind of kid that my parents could, like if I was doing something a little bit off, they gave me the parent look and I would cry just because of that look. So don't practice it right now. Like I might cry right now. But um, I was super sensitive, but I would like, I I just felt like the weight of all the rules and, and everything like that. But now that I'm getting older, the interaction I have with my parents is, is actually incredibly difficult, or different, not difficult, sorry, very different. Uh, my dad and I Zoom each other about once a month, my parents and, and my, um, my in-laws, uh, both sides of our family, they're 2,000 miles away in Michigan, and so we connect via Zoom, and um, you know, my dad doesn't speak into my life a whole lot, he doesn't go where he's not wanted, but uh, there's a difference. When, when I was younger, if he told me to do something, it was like, hop to it, let's go, don't get in trouble. But now when he says something, it's not that I, I, I reject it. it, I listen from a different place. Because the older I get, the more I see my dad as a human being, not as much as an authority figure that's kind of keeping me in my place, but somebody who actually cares a great deal about me. And, and until I, I'm the age that I'm at, and I, and I assume it's just going to keep developing, I, I've never been able to see my dad that way, like somebody who just continually showing me how much he loves me. And so when he tells me something now, it actually has a different weight to it. And if I listen to it, it's not because I'm afraid I'm going to get in trouble or I'm afraid I'm going to displease my dad. It's because I know he actually really loves me. Now, um, it might not be like in a parental relationship or a close relationship. You might find this dynamic, whether it's at work or uh, even just in society in general. But there's a difference between a set of rules that you have to follow and uh, outside of relationship and then things that are right inside of a relationship. Like, if you're at work and you don't have a good relationship with your superiors, anything that they're, to- they're telling you to do, it kind of feels a bit oppressive, doesn't it? And, and most of us, if we violate a, a rule or kind of a principle, there, there's a couple reactions. Some of us will kind of shrink back. We're like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. We're the rule followers. We're like, I feel really guilty. And then some of us are the rebels. We're like, not only did I break that rule, I'm going to tell you what you can do with all the rest of the rules that you made for me, right? Uh, but then th- that, that's kind of what, what like, the system feels like when we're outside of a relationship. But when we're in a relationship, and we grow in a relationship with the people around us, even people who, who have uh, kind of an authority over us, when they ask something of us, it feels entirely different. Like, like here's a, a truth. Many of us, we can, we can be spiteful at times, and we can look at people in our lives who have spoken something negative against us, and we can say, I'll show you, I'm going to do something in spite of that. And we can do some really cool things that way, but I find that the most powerful things, the best things that come out of our life are when people believe in us, and they love us, and we feel secure. Like, when you feel loved and secure, when you feel seen and valued, you are capable of amazing things. Well, the good news is that as we dive further into the book of Galatians, we're going we're gonna to discover a love that is so secure, an affection that is so sound, that it will enable you to do amazing, amazing things. If you've got a, a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Uh, you can Google it on your phone, use your Bible app, or you can follow along on the screen above us. The, the Scripture is going to be right up there. Now, uh, just a little bit of a background. Again, we've been walking through this letter. It was written by a guy named Paul. He started a bunch of churches in a, an area called Galatia. 
it was more of an ethnic area. It wasn't really like, a, it had a geography to it, but it wasn't like a, a political system. It was a, a group of people that were non-Jewish, and they were all starting to follow Jesus. And as they start following Jesus in what is now kind of like Western, modern-day Turkey, uh, Paul comes uh, through, starts the, the churches, moves on, and then somebody else comes through, and they start telling people, okay, that's great, like, we're Jewish Christians, you're non-Jewish Christians. Now that you believe in Jesus, just like us, you have to kind of follow the Jewish way. And that really bothered Paul because that was exactly the opposite of everything he said. So he writes back to them to encourage them, even to scold them a little bit and to kind of set things straight and really truly explain the good news that is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And in the middle of all of this, he starts going into this argument about how, uh, you know, the Jews say that they are the children. And they're the family of God because they keep the Jewish Old Testament law. But because of Jesus, you and I are adopted into his family. We are now also equal heirs and children of God. And as he writes this, he gets to chapter 4 and he, he says this, What I am saying is that as long as an heir <clears throat> is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery, under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, uh, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child, and since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, I would argue that this is like, this is, this is one of the, the pinnacles of everything Paul writes in this letter. This, there's something beautiful for us to grab hold of. But as Paul is talking about being children and part of the family of God, he switches to a different metaphor. He starts talking about being slaves and heirs. And he says this in, in verse 1 uh, that we just read. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. So let's backtrack just a moment. Uh, Paul had just written that if you are in Christ Jesus, if you are clothed in Christ, that means if you have your identity as being in Jesus, that you are a son of God. Now, he's not talking about gender son. He's not talking about a biological son. He's talking about having a, a social status the same as a son. Uh, now, sons inherited everything from the father's estate. They inherited the entirety of the father's estate, and the firstborn son inherited a majority of the estate. And, uh, and no matter what their age was, these sons, they all inherited the father's things, his possessions. And you can even see this. Uh, many of us are, at the very least, uh, familiar with the concept of the prodigal son. It's a, a story that Jesus told. There's a son who comes to his father. He's the second oldest and he comes to his father and he says, Father, give me all of my share of the inheritance. You see, even as a second-born son, the, the older son would receive a majority of the estate, a majority of the wealth, a majority of the possessions, but even the younger son was even in his current state an heir. And so he comes to his father and he says, whatever is mine, I want now. It wasn't supposed to be his yet but the Father gives it to him. That, that's the understanding of, of the state that all people are in, in Christ. We are heirs. Everything is, as Paul says, it's ours now. However, he says, as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. See, there was, there was just like there is today, there's certain things you can't do until you're old enough. There's certain rites of passage that we have. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the biggest ones for many people is the freedom of getting to drive a car. Like I remember when I was getting to drive a car and, you know, it was the 90s, so gas was like 95 cents a gallon, at least in Michigan. I could fill up my parents' minivan for $19. It was a good time. Not because I was driving a minivan. <laughs> that was not the good time. That was just sad, actually. 
Uh, but being able to fill it up for 19 bucks, that was pretty sweet. But there was this coming of age thing where we got to drive and now all like the world is mine. I was 16 years old. My parents let us drive uh, eight hours south to a music festival to camp with my friend who was also 16 without parental supervision. And I'd constantly go back to them and say, what were you thinking? And they were like, we don't know. <laughs> like, we don't know what we were thinking. We let it happen. There was this, this, this understanding of freedom, but it didn't happen until I was 16. Like, it, there was a, this time set for it. Until then, I wasn't able to. One day I would, but I wasn't ready for it yet. At 16, for whatever reason, we decide is the, uh, the age of maturity. Um, no offense, 16-year-olds. Like, talk with a few 16-year-olds, and you think, what are we thinking? <laughs> like, right? Like, we're putting these people on the road. I'm still thinking about that about many uh, people much older than 16 when I drive the streets of Yakima. Paul says, uh, he, he talks about this underage heir. Like, the whole estate is rightfully this heirs, okay? That's, that's the status level that Paul has put it at. And now he goes back and he says, but as long as that heir is underage, he's actually no different in status than a slave. Now, just at the face value, uh, slaves reported to their master. They had no rights. They were essentially property. And Paul is making the argument, as long as an heir is underage, he is like a slave. One day, he'll get to drive the car, but it's not time. Until then, he is subject to whatever somebody tells him to do. He has to do what they tell him to do. He has to go where they tell him to go. He doesn't have access to all of the resources that he will one day have access to. He says, although he owns the whole estate, he's like a slave. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. The father has a time, a time that he was going to act, a time that he was going to deliver to the heir everything that was rightfully theirs. But until that time, they're going to be under the governance of trustees and overseers. There's going to be somebody that's managing that estate until the heirs are mature enough to be able to handle it. You give somebody something too early and it's not good for them, okay? Like, we know that. There's things that we would probably love to have in our life and we think, you know what, if I had that now, I'd, I probably wouldn't use it well. <laughs> like, some of us were waiting to win the lottery. It's like, I don't, like, if I won the lottery, I would not be the most responsible person in the world. Like, that's just a reality. And, and Paul is saying, listen, an underage heir, there's a reason there's, there's an age of maturity there. And until that time, he is under the, uh, the, he's, he's under the authority of guardians and trustees, but there will be a time set by the Father when all of that is going to change, okay? Now, Paul uh, is, is referencing a couple of things here. One of the things he's referencing is he's speaking to the Jewish followers of Jesus in that sense. And, and at the very least, in part, he's referencing the law of Moses, this Jewish legal system of how to worship, how, how you needed to, to, what kind of clothing, what kind of cloak you needed to wear, the, the fringes on your cloak, like all of the, what it could be made out of, who you could interact with, how you ate, what, like all of this, the days you observed and how you, like it was spelled out to a T. And he said, when you were under that, the Jewish Christians, when you were under that, you were like an underage heir. God had so much for you, but you weren't ready for it. And, and so he puts over you this, this authority, this trustee who manages the estate until you're ready for it. Now, there's a time appointed by the Father for that, but the time is not yet. Now, he says in verse 3 through 5, he says, So also, when we were underage, now he's, he's expanding that circle of talk, not just to the Jewish Christians, but to everybody else who would put their faith in Jesus. He says, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew and you follow the Jewish law or you're not a Jew and you were never under the Jewish law. So it is for all the rest of us that we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, uh, when, when Paul says the elemental spiritual forces, he's not just talking about the spiritual beings and realities of the world. I, like, that's included. But what Paul is really referencing is any kind of a system that would act in place of the Jewish law. 
He was talking about any kind of, uh, uh, of divination, any other kind of religious practice, any other kind of rational thinking. Like I think if we took it out of what Paul is referencing for, for the churches in Galatia and we think about the church and the people in America, we're talking about a different kind of set of rules, but we are still under elemental spiritual forces. There are all sorts of ways that we choose to govern our lives in order to become the kind of people we think we want to become. We have a system of right and we have a system of wrong. And it might be the rules and the laws of the land. It might be rational thinking that if I could just be a purely rational being, then I can do everything that is right. I can do right by other people. If I could be pure, like that's, that's one of the guiding kind of thinkings in our society is that if we could be purely rational, if we could remove emotion from everything, and if I could just think rationally, I would do everything right, right? Because everything has a reason. And if I could just follow reason down the path, I'm going to do all right. Whatever that guiding system is, is like being in slavery. That's what, that's what Paul's claim is. It doesn't matter whether it's Jewish law or any other kind of conscience law in you. You and I, as long as we live under that system and that system alone, we're like slaves. We go where we're told to go. There's no relationship. It's just, it's just this oppressive boundary because we're not ready for the real thing yet. We're not ready. The elemental spiritual forces of the world. But, verse 4, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Paul says, uh, no matter what system you were under, that system made you a slave. But then one day at the right time, God sent his son Jesus. And he sent his son Jesus, uh, God in the flesh, born of a woman, under the law, under the same rules that everybody else has to live under. He sends Jesus at the right time in order to in order to live a certain way. He's born of a woman, born under the law. Why? To redeem those under the law. To redeem those under the law. Now, redeem is a very significant word. Redeem essentially means to buy back. It, it, it has all sorts of connotations. It could be as simple as, I sold something, now I'm buying it back. Kind of like a pawn shop. You sell it to somebody and you buy back. That's, that's redemption. I redeemed it. It doesn't have to be the super spiritual significant phrase. And in fact, I would argue here that to understand redemption as the simple act of buying something back that isn't yours, you buy it back. That's the, that's the understanding we need to grasp hold of here. Because what, Jesus, or what Paul is explaining about Jesus is incredibly powerful. He says, we were under the law. It doesn't matter which law you were. It makes you like a slave. And as long as you are a slave, you have no rights. You have no inheritance. You have no status. You have nothing. You are not in a family. You are the same as a possession. But praise God, because he sends Jesus, God in the flesh, to buy us out of slavery. This is incredibly powerful. He, he, calls, he, he calls on us to recognize the reality. Paul calls us to recognize the reality that Jesus comes to buy us out of a status. Because that status is the enslavement. It's a, it's a slavery mindset that makes us believe that however we live well can be accomplished on our own power. That's an enslavement. And Jesus comes along and he buys us out of slavery. Why? He buys us out of slavery that we might also receive adoption to sonship. Now again, Paul's not talking about a biological sonship. He's talking about a status sonship. Uh, I I love how uh, biblical scholar Douglas Moo states this. He says, Christ, the son, becomes human so that human might become sons. You see, as long as we're under that enslavement system, you and I can't act as as people who inherit everything the Father has. 
We'll try. We'll, do it in our, we'll try to do it in our own power, and we can even do some pretty impressive things, but we can't do amazing things while we're under the oppressive system of a set of rules that tells us who we are, what to be, and how much we are worth. So Jesus comes along, the Son of God comes along, becomes human, puts on flesh. Why? So that we as human can become sons. You see, a slave can't be adopted into another person's family. They're property. They have no rights. They can't be uh, adopted into God's family because they are already owned by something else. So Jesus comes along. He pays the price of his own life in order to purchase them out of slavery. Why? So that they can just be forgiven? No. So that they can be inheritors of all, the, the entirety of all of God's kingdom. You see, that's the status that we receive as followers of Jesus. That's the place we find ourselves not just free, not just forgiven. We're not just out of slavery. We're adopted into the family. We were slaves. Jesus purchases our freedom. And then because of his work, we are adopted into the family of God. You see, that's the end goal. It wasn't just to forgive you. It wasn't to get you out of hell. It was to adopt you into the family of God and to take on a new identity as sons, as inheritors of everything God has. It's a beautiful moment in the letter that Paul really drives home. Now, again, I want us to understand something because in the church we talk about being enslaved to passions. We talk about being enslaved to sin. We talk about being enslaved to all this stuff. But please catch this. Paul's not talking about being enslaved to bad things. He's talking about being enslaved in our own effort to the good things. You and I can be just as much in slavery to everything we think is right and good as long as it's in our own power. That's that's an enslavement to self-sufficiency. That's what Jesus buys us out because as long as we are reliant on ourselves, we will never be in the family of God. We can't. We can't receive something we're trying to earn. God wants to give us adoption into his family, and we're like, no, just let me earn it. I want to earn it. Let me do all the right things. No, you can't. Like, you can't do it. All of history says you can't do it, but let me try to earn it, God. I'm going to be good enough. Like, I'm going to get over this addiction. I'm going to get over this desire. I'm going to get over this this attitude. I'm going to get over this thinking, and and Jesus is like, no, I, I bought you out of that system. Stop going back to that system. I bought you out of it because as long as you're in that system, you can't become the children of God. It can only be received, it can only be given, it can only be a gift. That's how we enter in. So Paul says, Jesus redeemed us from the law that we might become adopted into the family of God. In verse 6, he continues on, he says, Because you are his sons, God sent his, the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now, because we are in the family of God, we get to receive the same things Jesus receives, his son. We are at the same status level, and part of that receiving, part of that inheritance is the person of God and the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus did whatever he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't do it in his divinity. He didn't do it because he was such a good human. He did it uh, as both God and man, fully under the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, that same spirit, that Jesus lived under is available to everybody in the family of God. This same spirit, this Holy Spirit that God poured out on his son in his baptism is now available to every child in the family. This is the first bit of the inheritance that you and I get that makes everything else possible. And Paul says, if we are his children, if we have the same status as Jesus, then that same spirit that was in Jesus is put into our hearts. And it is that spirit in us that cries out, Abba, Father. Now, most of us, uh, I didn't grow up calling my dad Abba. I didn't. Call me weird, call me different. Uh, I didn't do it. But, you know, uh, we don't live in a very uh, honoring and respectful culture. That's just, that's just the reality of it. 
Um, I, I, was, I had to grow up calling other people sir, ma'am, mister, missus. I couldn't call uh, people by their first name. And now when some, like a kid is like Mr. Kohler, I'm like, no, it's Dan, please. Like, please call me Dan. Don't call me Mr. Kohler. That's the weirdest thing in the world, and it will forever be weird. Okay? Now, there was, so there was some level of respect there, but when I was out in public, I called my dad the same thing that, uh, behind doors as I called him uh, outside uh, in, in wherever we were, in the restaurants. He was just dad, right? I didn't call him father outside and dad inside, but you know what? That's where we're different culturally because in Jesus' time, there was an honoring terminology outside of the household that was different from inside of the household. Outside, it was father. Inside, it was Abba. Outside it was respect, inside it was intimate love and care. And you see, that's the difference in the terminology is when, Jesus, or when Paul says that the Spirit put in us because of Jesus calls out Abba, he's referencing a different kind of intimacy. He's referencing a different kind of affection that is poured into our hearts by the very Spirit of God himself. You see, the Spirit in us pours into us a love that we can only experientially know if we have the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, you and I will grasp something intellectually. We'll grasp that, God's, that God loves us. I grew up in the church, so I grew up singing some of the most um, hard-to-get-out-of-your-head Sunday school songs that were ever invented, okay? Uh, Jesus loves me. Like, we, that was just... Every Sunday, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. You know what? I hate that song. Uh, If you want to fire me, like, we'll worry about that later. But I hate that song. And here's why. I don't know that the Father loves me because the Bible tells me so. I know the Father loves me because I am his son and he has poured his spirit into my heart and that spirit in me uh, births an experiential knowledge of knowing and experiencing the love of God. I don't need to hear it just from the Bible because I'm experiencing it in my heart on a regular basis. That's what the Spirit does. In the children of God, that's what our status with Jesus affords us is this experiential knowledge. And without that experiential knowledge, you and I are going to be running in every single direction, trying to earn some level of acceptance, trying to earn some level of understanding that we are loved. You know, sometimes I have to fish for compliments. Um, I think, I think, I could be wrong. I think I could be a word of affirmation kind of love person, but I don't do that. Like, I, I'm just not very connected with that. And so, like, I've been flirting a little bit with shaving my beard off. Just stick with me for a second. This actually has meaning. Um, I've been flirting a little while with shaving my beard off. And so every now and then, I'll, like, throw it out to the family and just see what they think. And Janine's like, why don't you just shave the thing already? And I'm like, I'm worried that I'm ugly under there. And, like, this is my fishing. I'm like, okay, so if I say that, then Janine will be like, no, you're going to be so handsome. She doesn't say that. (laughs) Like, I'm dangling the bait out there, and she never says, no, you're going to be so handsome. I'm going to love you, whatever. She's like, well, yeah, you might be pretty ugly under there. (laughs) Like, it's been a while. I haven't seen that face since you were 17. So who knows what's under there? Like, maybe you should keep it. Maybe you should harvest it off, tape it back together, put a little glue on it so that if you need to, you can just put it back on, right? Like, that's the kind of behavior we're always going to exhibit. We're always going to be fishing. We're always going to be looking. We're always going to be testing the waters for are we accepted, are we not accepted until we allow the Spirit of God to come into our hearts and affirm us. And the result of that is not just that we have some cutesy name to call God, right? The purpose of this passage isn't that you call God anything other than God. It's not so that you have a more intimate name for him. It's so that you can experience the love of the Father so deeply that it just pours out of your mouth and it's your confession. You see, I think so many of us, we we try to get backwards to this experience. We're like, if I could say with my mouth that Jesus... Uh, Jesus has made a way to the Father. If I could say and confess with my mouth that, God's lo- that God loves me, and if I say that uh, well enough, often enough, and long enough, that I'll just start to believe it at some point. There's no way to believe it from the outside in. The only way is to have the Holy Spirit in us birth this truth, this truthful confession that you are loved by the Father. 
What Paul is pointing out is not some cutesy name for God. He's pointing out the heart of the Father to you. You see, up until Jesus did all this for us, we were scrambling for any system we could find that would prove our worth, value, that we can be enough. And then Jesus comes along, he's like, I'm going to buy you out of that system, and I'm going to put my spirit in your heart so you don't have to worry about earning your value anymore. You can just know your value, and it's going to well up in you so thoroughly that you can't help but exclaim this most intimate terminology for the Father, this behind-closed-doors sort of terminology for the Father. A terminology that just spills out and it breaks all of the social protocols kind of experiential love of the Father. You don't have to know that Jesus loves you, that God loves you because the Bible tells you so. You can experience that that's supposed to be your walk with God. That's what's available to you now because of the work of Jesus. Paul sums all this up in verse 7. And he says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. He just sums it all back up. He's saying all of this is the work of the Spirit. A couple chapters ago, he said, have you come to faith in Jesus by the work of the Spirit, and now you want to go on in your own effort? That's silly. That's stupid. Don't do that. In fact, the Spirit in you has given you access to everything Jesus has so that you're not just uh, accepted into the family of God. You are of equal status with Jesus. And because of that, the Spirit himself is poured out into your heart, not just that you can know these things, not that just you, so that you can uh, be free of this old system, but that, so you can have a loving understanding of the heart of God for you. This is all about the Father's heart. Because until you capture the Father's heart, you're going to feel like he's distant. You're going to feel like it's an oppressive system of rules. You see, Christianity is not a system of rules that as soon as you come to Jesus, you're like, oh, okay, now I've got to follow more rules. Is that the point? I didn't follow Jesus before. Now I follow Jesus so I don't have my Sunday mornings. I don't get to sleep in. I'm supposed to do all these things. And if I don't do all those things, like read my Bible and pray every day, that was another Sunday school song. You're welcome. It's stuck in your head if you know it now. Like, if I don't read my Bible and pray every day, then somebody's going to judge me. And now, now, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with the list of rules. What's wrong is our heart posture toward them that we could ever fulfill them or be good enough simply by following the rules. It takes the Spirit in us to help us know who the Father is so that now when He speaks to us, everything changes. You see, when I know the Father's heart for me, and he asks something of me, it doesn't feel oppressive. It doesn't feel like a rule. It feels like something I'm happy to do. It sounds like wisdom. It sounds like, you know what, I, I believe, God, that you love me and you have my best interests at heart. So if that's what you're asking me to do, I think I need to do it, even if I don't understand it. My rational way of thinking is telling me that's not the right thing. But because you've poured your spirit into my heart, because I know your love, because I know the Father's heart for me, I will gladly do what he asks We always approach it the exact opposite way, but Paul's message about the Holy Spirit is very clearly this, and I, I need you to listen. The Holy Spirit reveals the Father's heart for you, and there's no other way. There is no other way to have the, the, the Father's heart truly revealed, this loving heart of the Father revealed to you other than the Holy Spirit. No amount of doing good is going to earn you his affection. No amount of striving is going to earn you this experiential love of God. It's only the Holy Spirit that is going to reveal the Father's heart for you. Now, if you're anything like me, you grab hold of that and you're like, got it. So the Holy Spirit reveals the Father's heart for me, so I go out and I just have to try harder. No. No, that's exactly the opposite. That's enslavement back into the system. You have to press into the gift the Father has given you that makes you able to know his love. I believe there's some of us who have been attending church our entire lives. You don't know a different world. You were born into the church. You were baptized the earliest moment your parents could talk you into it. And ever since then, you've just been going through the motions, and you're like, I hear that God loves me, but I'm just wondering when I'm actually going to start feeling like it. Like, when will I have done enough? I don't feel the Father's love. Maybe I'm not praying enough. 
Now, there are some things that we could do. But the moment we start running back to the system of do's and don'ts in order to earn the Father's love, we're missing the gift he's given us. The Holy Spirit has been given to you to reveal the Father's heart. And I know that seems very simple, but if you miss this point, I promise you, you're going to have a hard time experiencing the love of the Father. You're going to start feeling like he's distant. You're just going to keep going through the motions of every day, and you're going to be missing all the love and affection the Father wants to pour out to you. So I want to give us, uh, what can we do then? Like, okay, this is great, good news, uh, but here's what I believe. Everyone can experience the loving heart of the Father. And there are some things that we can do. I'm going to give you just kind of a a simple three-step process for experiencing the love of the Father. So the first one, everybody can experience the Father's loving heart for them when they first, number one, you have to make time, okay? Okay. Now, I'm intentionally not saying exactly what that time looks like yet because the first step is we have to make time. And again, this might seem so simple, but if you cannot make time, if I cannot make time, we can't get to the next steps. I I promise you that. And one of the biggest plagues in our society right now is the inability to slow down and actually make intentional space. And the moment we do, what do we do? We fill it with entertainment. We just want to numb out. We want to escape. We don't want to feel the way we feel. We have this huge letdown, and we don't know what to do with it. That is the result of not making time. But Dan, you don't understand. Like, I work so many hours every single week. No, I do understand. Uh, Tomorrow morning, I have to wake up, and I have to go away for a night when I've already been gone a lot from my family this year. I have to get up and go to something that I don't want to go to because somebody told me I have to go to it. Nobody here. It's okay. I have to get up and I have to go to it. I'm going to be gone for about 30 hours and then I'm going to come home and I'm going to try to cram in all the work that those 30 hours took away from me. I'm going to try to cram in the meetings. I'm going to try to cram in my sermon prep for the next week. I'm going to try to cram in all of these things. And then I'm going to get up, uh, I'm going to get up Wednesday, do that again. And I'm going, to, I'm going to leave early Wednesday to go out of town to, uh, to, with Janine to help another church up north. I have a busy schedule too. I'm not talking to you as somebody who's got every single thing perfected and figured out. I'm talking to you as somebody who can testify personally. If you and I do not make time, I promise you, I promise you, you will not get to experience the Father's heart. The Father's heart is only something that can be experienced when we make space and time for the Father's heart. That's experiencing his love 101. If you and I want to go from thing to thing to thing with a a casual acknowledgement of God, this isn't meant to bring discouragement and shame. This is meant to, to say, listen, as long as we are stuck in that system, we are living out the very reality of I can do enough, I can be enough, and I can have enough if I just try harder. If I just spend more hours, and this, there's this counterintuitive, this counter-rational approach to experiencing the Father's heart that you can't get there by trying harder and doing more and being more productive. You can only get there by doing less and allowing Him to be more. That's the only way forward. One of the, the greatest uh, spiritual teachers of, of a generation, Dallas Willard, was talking with his mentor on the phone, and his, or his mentee on the phone, and the mentee was asking him questions, and he said, listen, um, I have to teach people about how to experience God's goodness. I have, to ex- I have to teach them how to pursue God. I have to teach them how to do all this. What do, what, what do I, how do I do that? How do I communicate with them? And, and, and this guy, like this wise sage of a guy, Dallas Willard, he sits and he pauses on the phone. And then he simply says one of, one of, the, most, um, one of the most famous phrases, at least in, in some sectors of the church today, he says this, you have to teach them to ruthlessly eliminate all hurry in their lives. That was the step. You want them to experience the love of God, you have to teach them to ruthlessly eliminate all hurry in their lives. They will never experience the love of God. They will never experience the presence of God until they ruthlessly start eliminating the hurried life they're living. Step one is make time. Everything else is easy. (laughs) Honestly, the other two steps, they're so easy. This is the hardest one because it means we have to to, to understand something about ourselves. We have to step out of a system of slavery to what we can do and can't do, and we have to step into the loving, restful embrace of God. And that requires time. Step one, make time. Step two, 
We learn from the passage and we ask the Spirit to cry out. If the Holy Spirit is a gift given to you to reveal the Father's loving heart for you, then you need to make time, I need to make time, and then we just need to ask the Spirit to do that in us. We ask him, Holy Spirit, would you cry out this, uh, would you fill me with so much of the Father's love that I I can't do anything but confess it? Uh, One of my favorite shortest prayers is simply saying, uh, Holy Spirit, will you help me understand how the Father feels about me? Show me how the Father sees me when he looks at me. You can pray this a hundred different ways. Use your own words. But Paul says the Spirit's given to you to reveal the heart of the Father, to show you his love, so much so that it brings you to a different place of intimacy with him. If that's the case, all we have to do is ask. The hardest part was making the space. Then we ask, and in that space, your thoughts are going to be distracted. I get distracted so easily. Um, I take some pills to help with that, but, you know, even in prayer, it doesn't always work. And my thoughts run in one direction or another direction. And I just have to keep coming back to the prayer. Holy Spirit, would you reveal the Father's heart to me? That's it. And it brings me right back into that place. So we ask. If this is what the Spirit does, we just ask. And we keep asking. Keep repeating it. As often as you need to return back to that in the space and time that you've created for nothing else, not in the passing of the car, not as you're listening to a podcast during work, not as any of that is taking place, but in the space that you've carved out for just you and the Lord, start asking the Spirit to reveal the Father's heart for you. And then the last step is is very simple. It's let it wash over you. Let it wash over you. I was talking with somebody that I really respect um, a couple months ago, several months ago, and I was actually wrestling this out for myself because, uh, believe it or not, uh, I struggle with this as well. I struggle with sometimes just knowing the Father's heart and not having the experience of the Father's heart, and so I was just confessing that, and I said, listen, I get it. Like, I have walked with so many people through experiencing God's loving heart, but will you please explain to me for just one moment? Like, I get it intellectually, but how do I feel the Father's love? And I remember she, she looked at me and she said, uh, I want you to do this. I want you to lay on the floor in whatever space you have. Well, we were at a retreat at the time, so I went back to my room and did it there. But it, it could be anywhere that's your space. It's wherever the space is that you've made for you and the Lord. And she said, go back. I want you to lay on the floor. And I want you to put on your favorite worship music. And if it speaks of the Father's love, that's even better. And I just want you to, to take it in. That's it. I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to say anything. If you've asked for the, for the Holy Spirit to do that work in your heart, then I just wanna, I want you to let his love wash over you. That's it. Because God's love is a kind of love that you can't strive for, you can't earn, you can only let it wash over you. And so that's my advice to you is, is it, we can't get anywhere if we don't make the space Right? We, we have to make the space, we have to make the time. We ask for the, the Father's gift to us of the Holy Spirit to burden us this experiential understanding of God's love for us. And then we just let it wash over us. And, and here's what I believe will happen if you do this. If you do this, I, I believe that you are gonna start experiencing not just the Father's love, but as his love washes over you, other things get washed away. The spirit of striving, it gets washed away. The shame and condemnation of never being able to wash, uh, to measure up, it washes away. I even believe that uh, things that we struggle with that, that are even um, uh, of the level of addiction, I think some of those things start to wash away. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't participate in, in fighting against these things in our own power as well, but it means that we can't do anything out of a place of mere obedience without relationship. When you know the Father's love for you, when you are secure in this, when you do this, listen up. You are capable of amazing things. But you have to be secure in the Father's love for you first. Without the Father's love, you and I will just be working to try to prove other people wrong or try to work in spite of this or try not to get punishment, but God's not a God of punishment. He's a God who pours his spirit out in you that you might know his love and live in light of his love. And it's that kind of a love that's gonna wash over you and start washing all of those things away. And you have to let it. You just have to receive it. 
We have to believe that God is better. Let it wash away. I want to pray, and I'm going to have the worship team come up, and then I'm going to invite you into something in just a moment, but let's pray first. 